Amen. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, if, uh, if you guys remember, uh, back in chapter 7, Paul was, he's been basically answering some questions that the church of Corinth had given Paul, and he began to answer these questions previously. So that's what this letter is all about. He's kind of answering some of their uh, the questions that they had. And he already gave a lot of answers. You know, he talked about marriage, divorce, remarriage. He talked about being single. Uh, and in chapter 8, he began to answer uh, the question regarding things offered to idols. And so Paul had mentioned three things concerning idols in chapter 8, he dealt with knowledge, and he said, you know, knowledge puffs up. And he dealt with idols, saying basically they're nothing. He dealt with food, uh, which I was encouraged, and basically said, hey, have at it. Eat it, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. Food is just food. Uh, but he also uh, w said what mattered really more so is considering others around you. Right, and, and that involves love. And love, uh, he said, is what builds us up. Love edifies. And, um, and Jesus is our example of what love is, right? First John chapter uh, 5, uh, verses 7 and 8. And so people were concerned about, you know, food. And, and you know, they would come together as well, uh, like, kind of like what we do, uh, as they go through the Word of God, and they would also have kind of what we do with like a potluck, right? And they would eat together, and then some people would be like, oh, I know that food was offered to an idol in the market. I just walked by it, and I'm not going to eat that. And, and so Paul is addressing, uh, he, what I thought was interesting, he doesn't address the idols, he doesn't address the food, he addresses the hearts of the believers more so. He kind of puts us in check. And what, so he said what mattered more was you know, the, our actions and how it affected others. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he said, but beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. And so it's not about idols. It's not about knowledge. It's not about food. Um, it's about love, right? It's about loving others uh, to a degree, to a place where um, we love them more than our Christian liberty, right, that we've been given by the Lord, our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. We're, we're willing to lay that down so that we don't stumble our, another believer in their walk with the Lord. We're a little more cautious, if you will. So chapter 8, Paul dealt with the problem uh, as well as the solution um, to the problem. Now as we come to chapter 9, uh, Paul it talks about his authority to deal with this problem that he talked about in chapter 8. And so let's go ahead and read for context's sake, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, look at verse 1. He says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense. Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Do these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. This is written that he who plows should plow in hope. And he who thrashes in hope should be partaker of this hope, of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, uh, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right uh, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. 
Verse 13, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat the things of the temple? And those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. Verse 14, even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. And so in these next 14 verses uh, that we just read, uh, Paul, again, he is basically talking about his authority uh, to deal with this problem from, well, that he addressed in chapter 8. You know, and get the picture. So chapter 8, he's recognizing that the problem is, you know, dealing with the, the idols, right? That, the, you know, the, the, the food, you know, and it was, it was offered to the idols. Um, and so he offered the solution to love others um, so much so that you're willing to lay down your own freedom uh, in Christ Jesus for the sake of your other weaker brethren, right? So just in case some people question Paul's authority and they're like, well, who do you think you are to tell me to love others more than myself? Or, right, who do you think you are to tell me not to eat this food or to eat this food? Or, uh, so Paul is going to correct that before, you know, the silliness comes to him and he has to address it again. Uh, and so here in chapter 9, Paul is confirming his authority to deal with the problem uh, really in three ways, if you're taking notes. First of all, it's confirmed by the Corinthians themselves in verses 1 and 2. Then we're going to see, second, it's confirmed by really common sense uh, in verses 3 and 7. And then third, we're going to see it's confirmed by the commands of God, the commands of God in verses 8 to 14. So let's go ahead and look at the first section. That, that It's confirmed by the Corinthians themselves in verses 1 and 2. Uh, and there's two ways that Paul confirms his authority. Uh, and the first question, or really, the, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm flying through this, um, the first way we see him uh, confirming his authority is there, there's a series of questions that we see here in verse 1, and, and he gives four of them. They all demand a yes, by the way, uh, on all of them. Um, the first question is, he says right here in verse 1, am I not an apostle? So obviously, yes, Paul is an apostle, right? By the way, this word apostle, uh, apostolos, is used 81 times in the New Testament. It just speaks of a messenger or a, uh, one who is sent out. And, and so it's simply a, a title, uh, which I thought was interesting because in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, did you guys know that Jesus is uh he has the title of an apostle as well because it's just simply a title that's all it is um and and so the disciples if you guys remember the 12 disciples that followed jesus they are also called and labeled as apostles according to matthew chapter 10 and you and i as believers in christ jesus um, are as well, by the way, according to Galatians 1.19, Romans 1, 1.5, Acts chapter 14, uh, because God has sent us out with the message, right? To minister to other people, to proclaim the gospel. Thus, we are in the right, in that title, uh, have that same kind of title in that sense. Uh, but Paul is obviously an apostle. Uh, you guys remember in Acts chapter 9, um, he, you know, was converted there on, on the road to Damascus, was told to go to the road straight, or the street there, and, uh, you know, he received his sight, but he saw that light, right? And that light was Jesus. Jesus says he is the light of this world. Well, he is the light, right? We're the light of the world. Um, and he also is humble, and he says, I know a man. <laughs> I think he's talking about himself, but he went up to the third heaven, right? So uh, I think rightfully, obviously, he says it right here, too, that he has seen Jesus. So um, he is rightfully an apostle. Now, he says the second question. He says, am I not free? The answer is yes. Of course he's free. As a believer in Christ Jesus, you're free. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus, right? Paul also was free because he was a Roman citizen. He wasn't bound as a slave, if you will. But in a sense, when you come to the Lord, uh, you, are, you are a slave to God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 22. Um, and now the third question is, Paul says, have I not seen Jesus, 
Christ our Lord? The answer is yes. Again, they're on the road to Damascus, right? Acts chapter 9, verse 5, um, he did see the Lord. And so it would seem, by the way, speaking of a, you know, what does it mean to be an apostle? What is it, what's the, what's the biblical view? Acts chapter 1, verse 22, I think it is, yep. Um, it, it would seem that you had to be there in Jesus' day, uh, those three years of ministry that Jesus was there, the, he was walking, the disciples saw that he had did, they heard his teachings. Uh, those who were around, those would be rightfully called an apostle. And so that would be, I guess you can say, the requirement to be an apostle. Now, the fourth question is, are you not my work in the Lord? So the answer is yes. The, the church at Corinth, uh, they are the work of, well, Paul, right? Um, God used Paul to go to Corinth to proclaim the gospel. God used Paul uh, to proclaim the gospel, and they heard and became saved, right? Because of the work that God used through Paul and his availability. So, um, which, by the way, sets the stage for our second section here. Um, so not only was there a series of questions, uh, but number two, there's a seal of apostleship, a seal of apostleship. Here in verse two, it says, if I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship, he says. So the Corinthians were the seal of Paul's apostleship. Uh, by the way, this word seal carries the idea, carries the, the, the uh, idea really of proof or um, authenticity or uh, we would say certification. So back in the day, uh, if you're going to send a letter to somebody, you would seal it up, right? And then you would get that hot wax on there. And then you would get your signet ring that, or whatever, you know, you, some people had it on staffs and whatnot, uh, that signified you, your household, right, and your family. And they would seal it, basically, right? They would, they would hit that. And so um, it would be a seal. It would be it, of uh, authenticity. It would be certifying that it came straight from you. Uh, it wasn't tampered with. It wasn't opened at all. You knew that the message was from the person that you're receiving, receiving it from, right? So, um, and so Paul uses this illustration to certify that the Corinthians uh, were his work since they came to faith through uh, really the sharing of him sharing the gospel to them. And so remember the problem, right? Paul just dealt with here in chapter 8 um, with the things offered to idols. And so here Paul is confirming that they are his seal of uh, uh, apostleship. So in other words, what Paul said in chapter 8 he had the authority to say that, right? So that's what he's saying. He's, saying he's backing himself up here. So um, we too, guys, we have authority as believers if we're speaking the word of God to others um, because that's where our, our authority is, right? That's where all the power is. It's in the word of God. The problem is when we talk to other people, um, sometimes we want to give them what they want to hear, right? They're like, I'm sick. Pray that I get healed. Why are you praying that all this other stuff? I just want to be healed, right? Or uh, we pray for a bunch of stuff, right? Um, and, we, you know, people want the, the problem to be eliminated or, or, you know, to settle a problem or whatever. And, and, and we can tickle ears in that sense. We got to be very cautious to just present the word of God. Uh, it's, I mean, to me, it's a, it's, it was the hardest thing to do when I first came to the Lord, uh, but now it's the best thing that I've learned to do for other people. It doesn't matter what age they are. They could be little kids. They could be older, you know, really, really old on their deathbed. You present the Word of God. It's not about you and your knowledge and who you are. It's just God's Word being free and powerful, right? And it's able to uh, literally impact anybody's hearts. Um, which is amazing. So um, we have to make sure that we're, we're presenting the word of God because that's our authority, right? And, and it, it may not be what they want to hear, but hey, the word is powerful. And, um, 
it ought to be something that we should all receive, right? When someone's presenting the word, listen up, right? It, it doesn't matter who the person is, it's the word. And, and I think we all need to take heed to that. So a second way Paul's authority is confirmed is not only by the Corinthians themselves, but it's also by common sense, common sense. When you're reading verses three to seven, it's like, oh, duh. <laughs> So the confirmation to eat things offered to idols, uh, setting aside our freedom, our Christian liberty, right, that we have in Christ Jesus for the sake of really loving others, it should be, ought to be common sense, right, to others. But in verses 3 to 7, Paul brings up the issue of support. And, and Paul paints this picture of them saved since God used Paul to, well, to present the gospel. And, and since he was the one used by God to start the church, it was the church of Corinth uh, that ought to have been supporting Paul, basically. And so he ministered to them spiritually. Uh, it ought to be their obligation to minister to him physically. And so that's what he's going to talk about here. So Paul brings up three different issues uh, as it pertains to, well, common sense, right, uh, uh, supports in verses uh, uh, three to seven. So the first thing involves eating, eating. Notice in verse three and four, and I like this, it says, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? So it's common sense that the church of Corinth should be providing uh, food and drink for the Apostle Paul. Since Paul provided food and drink, if you will, spiritually uh, to the church of Corinth, uh, they ought to be ministering back in the way of, well, materially, right? And so, in fact, Paul said in Galatians 6, 6, he says a little step further here. He says, let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches in Romans 15, 27, in the middle there, it says, For if the, the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty, duty is also to minister to them in material things. So the principle is simple. We need to feed those who are basically feeding us, right? Support those who are supporting us and taking care of us. It's common sense. And so don't, don't you know, I think about it. Don't charge the pastor, if you're doing a Christian event, right, and he's hungry, they'll be like, oh, for you, that's 10 bucks, buddy, <laughs> right? Uh, so here's kind of a biblical thing right here. It's fine. If we have a potluck, right, and be like, hey, you, it's a dollar, buddy. Uh, it should be free, right, if it, it fits to the pastor. So the second confirmation uh, that involves common sense not only involves eating, uh, but it also involves marrying. Notice in verse 5, he says, do we have no right to take along a believing wife? As do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord. He's talking about, you know, Jude and James and, uh, and Cephas, who is Peter. Uh, Peter, by the way, we know was married. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 30. And so some people believe Paul, uh, they believe he was married at some point. Uh, what happened, we don't know, to his wife. Uh, but we do know when he's writing this letter, 1 Corinthians, uh, that she's not in the picture anymore. And, and so, in fact, in 1 Corinthians 7, 7, uh, you know, it's talking in the context of marriage and being single. Paul says, I wish you were all as I am, uh, speaking about being single. So uh, we know he was single at that point. So, um, but the point is, if, if Paul did have a wife, if he did have kids, uh, it's just common sense that the church would basically take care of him and his wife and his kids, right? His wife, she's his support, if you will. She's his helpmate back in Genesis. That's why God made uh, Eve, right? We're to help one another, submit one to another, uh, Ephesians 5, 22, I think it is. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think about it with my wife. If, if, with that, I don't even know what I could do without my wife, honestly. I really don't. She, like, literally is my other half of my brain. I'm like, I, I, you know, I don't have a word to say. I just look at her, and she knows, oh, this is that. Oh, thank you. Or I don't know my schedule. What are, am I busy this? What are we doing today, right? She's like my, she's everything. I don't know. I'd be lost. Anyways, um, praise the Lord. So the third thing involves working. Working, in verse, they're, they're uh, working, making these tents, 
And so instead of receiving from the church, I'm sure they were giving to the church instead. Uh, and so if they are ministering, you know, in spiritual things, that's basically what Paul is saying. He's, he's saying, hey, if we're, we're no different than the other apostles, why, why show partiality, right? If, you're, if Peter comes to town and you uh, are able to show hospitality to him and his wife, why is there, it, there shouldn't be any, you know, partiality with Barnabas and I, just because we work, just because maybe he was wealthy at that time. Maybe he owned his own business. I don't know. Um, and so he's saying there still shouldn't be any partiality. There still should be hospitality, right? Um, and an open, you know, arms, if you will. So it's our obligation, and that's what he's saying to the Church of Corinth, to, um, to share in those material things if they're sharing with the spiritual things. So Paul's saying, is, is Barnabas and I, uh, you know, the only ones who have no rights, um, right, uh, or obligation, if you will, or for support? So Paul gives three illustrations to back up what he's saying here uh, in verse 7. It involves a soldier, it involves the farmer, and it involves the shepherd. Look, look at verse 7. It says, whoever goes to war at his own expense, so right, nobody does, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. Guys, we pay soldiers to go to work, right, to go to war. Uh, if you got enlisted to go to war, they're not going to be like, hey, buddy, this helmet's going to be 50 bucks, uh, and this uniform, by the way, is going to be, we're going to just keep charging you for everything. <laughs> that gun, $1,000 doesn't make sense, right? You get paid uh, to be a soldier. If you're going to, uh, you know, have your own crops, your own vineyard, uh, you're able to, you know, help yourself out to your own produce there. Uh, if you are, have your own, I don't know, your cows and goats and whatever, you're going to you receive some of the, the milk from that, right? I have chickens. <laughs> I feed my chickens. They give me eggs every morning. It just works. It's perfect, right? Um, and which I like. So, um, it's wonderful, but, uh, so Paul's saying it's common sense to support them, right? The church should say, hey, Paul, you've been ministering to us, uh, let us minister back onto you. That's basically the common sense of what Paul's talking about here. And I understand the struggle of, uh, I mean, uh, you know, you could be working all day, you're exhausted, you come home, uh, and this happens all, a lot for us, right? Somebody's at the house, and I'm, you know, it's one of those days where you're just drained, and you're done, and then, and then, you know, we all have things that are going on in our lives, and, and that's what my heart is. I want to be there for you guys as well. Um, so you're, you're ministering to other people, maybe counseling right throughout the week, and then you need to study yet, but it's prioritizing your time. You, you know, then there's my wife, and I don't want to neglect her. And then there's the children, and they need time, right? You got to prioritize time for them. Uh, and then the church. Uh, and so it's, it's one of those things that you balance, right? So if you're working all day, and then you got to study. And for me, I'm a slow learner. So some of you guys are really quick, where you're like, wow, I got the whole study right there in five minutes. And uh, for me, it takes literally a whole day. <laughs> I'm going through all word for word and, you know, putting it out. And then I finally get an outline. And then, then I finally, it just takes forever. Uh, and then a lot of prayer, because I'm very distracted. And I have to constantly be in prayer. But uh, so I understand. I understand uh, kind of what's happening here. So let's come to the third section, how Paul is dealing with this problem. It, it was confirmed by the command of God, number three. Uh, and this is in verses 8 through 14. Uh, and there's four things about this command uh, of God or the word of God or the, you can say the law of God. Um, number one, Paul acknowledges the command. He acknowledges the command here in verses 8 to 10. He says, do I say these things as a mere man? So everything he's been saying in chapter 8, you know, idols are nothing. Um, you know, knowledge puffs up. Food is good. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Um, but we are to love others, right, uh, more than our freedom, if you will. Uh, and Paul's saying, do you guys think I just made all that up, that I'm just, you know, writing stuff for fun of it, right? No. It, that the church ought to bless, you know, those who are sent out. He acknowledges the command uh, that is of 
It's out from the Word of God. He, he takes from the Word of God. He says, this is what the Bible says, uh, which I love about Paul, by the way, and that should be our hearts as well, not just saying, hey, this is what I think or what I believe. We should be saying, here's what the Word of God says. And so this is what he says. Look at verse 8 right here. He says, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it shreds out the grain. Is it oxen God is concerned about? So Paul's quoting from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4. And, and back in the day, um, you know, they would get the ox together, they'd get the yoke in the middle, and they get the milestone uh, thing in the middle there, and, and then they'd be treading over all the grain, whatever it is. But they would, they would muzzle the ox. And so God says here in Deuteronomy, he says, guys, that's wrong. <laughs> uh, don't put a muzzle on the ox. That's just wrong. It's working really hard. It's laboring all day. It's sweating. It's hungry. Let it eat, right? It's, I mean, don't muzzle the ox while it's working. Uh, let, it, let, it, let it have some of its own labor, if you will. And so Paul says here in verse 9, in the middle, in the end here, it says, he says, is it, is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? And then he answers it, for our sakes, no doubt. This is written what, uh, that he who plows should plow in hope. And he who thrashes in hope should be partaker of his hope. So, uh, in fact, in 1 Timothy, Paul says in chapter 5, verse 17, he says, let the elders, or the, you know, the pastor elders, uh, who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So Paul links double honor uh, to the elder pastor, right? Um, to, to food in verse 18, which I think is great. So, uh, hey, if the pastor wants to have double portion, right? Let him. It's great. I'm not going to attest and say anything bad about that. I'm, hey, I'm all for it. Um, just don't gluttony there. But um, let, let's come back to the second command. Not only does Paul acknowledge it, but he applies the command. He's applying the command here in verse 11. It says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? So, uh, I don't even know where to go here. People today, they have the idea that well, think about it. Pastors are servant leaders, right? They're, that's what we are. We're servants, and that's our heart's desire. We constantly want to be under you, right? Prioritizing you, if you will, or uh, preferring you above ourselves, and, and coming alongside you as a shepherd. That's what a shepherd does, right? You, you're guiding, you're leading, you're feeding, uh, but you're you're not above and beyond everybody else, right? Kind of, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? They had that I'm higher than you, little citizens, right? Uh, a pastor ought to be a servant. But the, 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 the notion or the idea there is uh, some people treat pastors as if, oh, it's just, oh, you're the pastor. Hey, why don't you wash my feet? Here, ugh, they stink. Here you go. Hey, now get out of here, right? Like, that's how some people treat pastors. They think that pastors ought to be poor, and, and they ought to be in a constant mode of, of need, right? Like, oh, how am I going to pay the bills this month? How am I going to, right? And they, they, they treat them as like filth, uh, the filth of the world, if you will, which is sad to say, right? Like in the Christian, we, we shouldn't be that way. It should, that should not be the case, uh, but it kind of is. So um, if you think about it, if people are getting paid for working for men, uh, people, those who are working for the Lord ought to be getting paid as well, right? It just makes sense. So I, I grew up in um, Calvary Chapel uh, in Tucson, Arizona, and, you know, I thought I was getting the word. I was going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Uh, my pastor started off as, you know, a little home church, uh, but he started off with the percentage for himself, you know, off of that, which was probably okay when, it, when that was happening, but as the years, per, you know, came, uh, he kept that percentage, and, you know, they're at, like, I don't know, four, five, six thousand people. I mean, huge. They got two facilities, and I don't know how many services, and, and uh, just huge. And I know, you know, as being a pastor on staff, 
we were getting millions of dollars coming in. But every year, he would keep that percentage. And I'm not going to say too much there. Um, but, you know, fancy, really, really fancy, wealthy house. Uh, the, always the latest trucks. Uh, the latest, you know, I don't know how many speed boats he had. He loved fishing. Uh, and this and that, right? You get the idea. Uh, I remember even I go to California, and I, I started going to... Uh, some of the, the, I guess you can say celebrity pastors, right? Ray Bentley and I was a Mike McIntosh, I was at Costa Mesa. Greg Laurie, right? He's got a Hummer that he came in on with bulletproof windows. Then his wife pulls up in the same Hummer, a different one, bulletproof windows and everything. It's like, wow. And it was, I just remember growing up and just the reality of like, wow, like this, there's, it's almost like something's wrong here, right? And uh, it doesn't take hard for you guys if you want to search a Google search or something for uh, pastors with multi-million dollar mansions and right, all of that. Just really sad. I, I think that a pastor, sh there should be a cutoff, right? Uh, and that's why you guys got to pray for the leadership here because they're in charge of all the, the finances uh, and making sure that there's not too much, right? Like there's got to be enough was enough and just keep it there. Don't let it go crazy, <laughs> uh, which is sad to say that a lot of people do that. Anyways, a third aspect to this command is uh, Paul does not abuse the command at all. In, ver in verse 12, and I love this, he says, if others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we, not, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So Paul had every right to be fed, to be paid, to be, uh, you know, um, have a living basically from the Corinthians, but he never pushed it. He never, um, he never enforced it. He, he didn't abuse his rights. He knew that there were those maybe in the church of Corinth that were sensitive to this area. He worked, right, with his own hands. He didn't even bother taking anything from the church, but he says, but rightfully so, he can, right? He's in that position. He's he was used by the Lord in that area of uh, authority, if you will, leadership. So today, again, there's a lot of people that abuse, a lot of pastors that abuse their right, if you will. They have, you know, $100 million mansions. Um, what was it? or $65 million Learjets, right? Um, Kenneth Copeland. <coughs> I'm not saying any names. Uh, I don't know how many jets he has, by the way, but um, I mean, they, I'm crazy, right? It's like, wow, Stephen Furtick, how many mansions do you need, buddy? And uh, it just, it's crazy. Anyways, sorry. I, <laughs> let's come to the last thing here. He amplifies the command here in verses 13 and 14. Look at verse 13. He says, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? So if you guys remember the priest and the, well, the Levites, uh, they would receive from the things offered to the temple. Uh, that was their reward, right? The Levites, they didn't have any property like all the other tribes. So uh, according to Numbers chapter 18, it talks more about that. But look at verse 14. It says, even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So take care of them because you love them, right? The same idea of eating food, uh, you're not going to eat certain food because your other brother might stumble, right? Another believer might stumble. Uh, not just food, but in everything, right? The clothing we wear, I'm not going to wear that if that stumbles my brother or my sister. Uh, even the song selections that we pick, right, at church, uh, I'm not going to sing this one if it hinders my brother. Uh, I, I'm not going to you guys get the idea, right? There, we just got to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and have that discernment biblically uh, to be sensitive to one another and uh, understanding that we're all at different rates, right, if you will, in our growth and our walks with the Lord. Uh, some are here and some are there. And, and, and we got to just encourage each other's walks with the Lord, not discourage it. Uh, and, and trip somebody up on their, with their walk with the Lord. By the way, guys, um, I know there's a few new people here. We don't teach on money. Uh, we don't pass the offering plates, right? Um, we, uh, we do teach on it whenever we get there because we go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And obviously here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul's kind of dealing with that situation. 
Uh, and so we're going to, we, we talk about it, um, but uh, we don't always talk. There's other churches that abuse, they, they fleece the flock, right? And they're constantly talking about money and how God wants your money. And, and if you do this, and then when you give, you come back next week and they're still got the same thing over and over again. It's like, oh, I went to a church in California and I kid you not, I think it was like seven times they kept passing the offering plate. They're like, okay, now we're going to pass it, and now we're taking a collection for this, and then we're taking it. And there was a, a really popular baseball player that was right next to me that, uh, I, don't, I can't even know his name, but um, so they kept looking at him the whole time. <laughs> we know you got money, so <laughs> we're going to pass it again. Did, did he give some money? No. Oh, oh, all right, we're going to pass it again. <laughs> I was like, wow. Uh, very, very sad. So we don't do that here. Uh, we just trust the Lord. If you, you've been coming here, this is where the Lord has you. Uh, then you'll find out where and how to give. Uh, if you do, it's an act of worship. We don't want your money. We really don't. Uh, if you're not a believer, I, if anything, I think you hinder the work of God by giving your money. We really don't want that. We, we want it to be, this is the church, right? And it should be an act of uh, really holiness, right, onto the Lord. It's an act of your heart's response to the Lord. It's a joy, uh, not just financially, but in whatever it is, your talents, the gifts that you have, uh, that you offer to the Lord. So if you're not a believer, please don't give, right? That's probably hurting our treasure. <laughs> Somebody here, but uh, we don't want it, right? Uh, that's the, we don't want the work of the flesh. That's what we always pray about. Lord, you move by your spirit, right? Uh, not, not, we don't want to do anything in there to help God in that sense. So 